All right, today's going to be fun. And when I say fun, I literally mean fun. Uh, we got one of the funny more efforts in this building today. <laughs> Writer, uh, actor, comedian, author, number one best-selling book on Amazon. Please give it up to LA's own, my man, Alex Thomas. Alex, what up, bro? Man, I appreciate the love, brother. What's your cash app? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm definitely sending that cash app to you. <laughs> um, no, what's what's crazy is um what you sound very New York. Oh, I'm hundred percent born and raised BX Bronx in the building. BX, the boogie down, the home yeah. of hip hop. There you go. 50 See? years of hip hop. Let's give it up to Cool Herc right now. He Come on, celebrate. man. Cedric and Cedar, Cedric and Cedar. Hold up, how you know about all that? Are you forgetting that I I am celebrating 30 years of stand-up comedy this month? I've been you performing in New York. I have been performing in New York for 30 years, brother. New York is like my second home. My daddy's from Harlem, okay? Even though I'm a straight South Central LA dude, he was born there, but I've New York was like my second home. You got to think about it. My first TV appearance ever, 1991, Apollo. Standing ovation at Apollo. Cut to Deaf Comedy Jam. Cut to Apollo Comedy Hour. Like, New York has always been my second city, man. So I know New York like the back of my hand. And I'm a history buff. And on top of that, I'm a hip-hop history buff. So I could talk to you about New York. You would think I was from Brooklyn or Queens or Yonkers and wherever. So you you were the dude that, that could speak your language, brother. I'm, I'm gonna keep it so real with you, and 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 I want you to pardon the disrespect, because I meant to say in the intro, thirty. This brother celebrating thirty years in the business. Do you like like like? I'm I'm a former Alex. Do you accept my apology? Nah, nigga, I'm out of here. <laughs> 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 Wait, can I cuss? Because I heard you say mother effers. I'm like, am, am I, can I not cuss? No, no, you can cuss. I, I just don't cuss. Do I have but, to but, say tush yeah, and rump? But, I, I but, will say the N-word all day long, but I don't cuss, which is bananas to me. That's good. I was about to say, so I said, should I replace ass with tush and rump? And stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse you, me, young lady. May I have some rump or tush? <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, what's going on here? No, you, you, you are, are more than welcome to speak with all the profanity that you have in your soul, my brother. Well, I appreciate that, motherfucker. So, look, <laughs> um, what I wanted to no, just <laughs> what was your question, man? Let's go, let's go. Let's take it back to the beginning. Matter of fact, I'm gonna take it back to 30 years ago. How yeah. Are you just a naturally funny dude or like, how did you even get in the business? What's crazy, man, is high school was class clown, best sense of humor. It, it, it wasn't like I was, you know, running for that. It's not like in September, I'm like, hey, vote for me, class clown in June. You know what I mean? It just, I guess I was just the silly dude in the hood. It's almost like I think of a joke that Richard Pryor did 50 years ago when he said, man, when he went to jail. And he said, man, I kept them niggas laughing to keep mm -hmm. their minds off the booty. <laughs> but in my case, I kept them niggas laughing to kick their asses from wanting me to be in the gang or do some street shit because I wasn't cut out for that. Even though I was born and raised around all of it, I was the dude that had everybody in the hood laughing. But I didn't know it was going to eventually turn into my life. I didn't, I didn't know I was going to end up being a comedian and an actor and an author and all these TV shows and movies. It, it just, my career really happened organically, man. I can't, I would be lying to you if I told you at 17 years old, I knew I wanted to be the next Eddie Murphy. No, I was, I just like making people laugh, man. It was just, it's really me. Everybody that knows me will tell you, that's really that dude. He's not something different off stage. I'm not a completely different guy. Like, no, I'll be talking to somebody, whether I'm sitting on a subway or we eating at subway and somebody be like, yo, man, you taking that to the stage? I'm like, I might. Is that some of your material? 
No, I was just talking to you and I started to laugh. And now the flip side is, you know what? Because you tearing up and you laughing so hard, I might have to take that to the stage. You know what I mean? Yo, so material was just natural to me. Somebody just asked me a show I just recently did. They asked me, like, as a comedian, how do you come up with material, right? Mm -hmm. That's a question I get everywhere. And my answer, man, is truly like traveling, seeing the world. 30 years of comedy has literally brought me around the globe. I'm talking from South Central LA to Jerusalem, you know, from Maine to Spain, from Alaska to Nebraska. I perform from the Bronx to the North Pole. Like niggas think I'm lying when I say the North Pole. I did a show six months ago. Yo, stop, in the, stop wrong. Are you dude, I'm, I'm not even bullshit. I met Santa Claus and Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. He was at the house that day, like dead serious. Oh, I have pictures with Welcome to the North Pole behind me. Do you know where the North Pole is? No, that, that's what I, I didn't even know the North Pole was a real like destination. I understand I, it. I, I didn't. Pole than a North Pole, but I didn't know it was a destination. I didn't either till I landed in the airport, brother. I thought it was a joke. So North Pole is AKA Fairbanks, Alaska. It is the furthest northern point before basically you get to the Arctic Circle. And it's called Fairbanks, Alaska. And it just happens to have one of the biggest military bases in America. So with that being said, uh, 1,500 people sold out theater, nothing but niggas in the Are north. Are you serious? Hold on. In Alaska? I, I am not exaggerating. I mean, it felt like I was on stage in Brooklyn. It felt like I was on stage in Compton. It felt like I was on stage in the Fifth Ward in Houston. It felt like I was on stage in Miami. It felt like I was on stage in Detroit, Chicago, because it's black folks from all over America that go to their military base. So it was it was like being, nigga, I didn't see one Eskimo while I was up there and shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I'm not even lying. It was, it happened to be one of the North Pole's coldest days ever it was 61 below brother get out of here i'm like who the hell's gonna come to a comedy what show like? like what does that even you you step off a plane and it's 61 below okay and you live in in southern california what does that even feel like to a nigga uh let me explain to you brother I, i'm born and raised in la we are wearing wife beaters on christmas my whole life it's 72 on Chris, I can tell you right now, before Christmas even comes, I'm gonna be in shorts and laying out by my pool uh, on Christmas next year. That's just how it is here, right? But you ask me what a 61 below feel back, like what Correct. it feels like? Okay, so let me ask you a question. Are you in a house right now? Yes. Do you have a refrigerator or a freezer? Absolutely. What I'm gonna ask you to do, cause you asked me, how does that feel? What I need you to do is go get, you have like a punch bowl, or like a bowl in your house, in your kitchen? Sure. Fill it up with ice and just uh, drop your nutsack in it for about five minutes. <laughs> That's how the fuck it felt. 61 <laughs> below. I'm dead serious. I had never been, when I say snow up to my nuts, but you gotta understand, there's literally nothing else to do up there. So the comedy show was a reason for these people to get out. And when I tell you they appreciate it, it was so cold. I saw a polar bear in the airport. Like I'm not even, I'm not even lying to you. Like, let me, let me tell you the final part of the story. So one of the comedians missed their flight. It's four comics. He missed his flight. Three of us show up in the airport. The promoter picks us up. He's like, man, I got good news and I got bad news. We're like, what? One of the comics missed their flight. And we're like, okay. He goes, the next flight's not coming in for three more hours. And we're like an hour drive from where our hotel is. He goes, so if you guys want, we can stall a little time. We're like, okay, it's 61 below outside. What are we gonna do? He's like, y'all wanna hit the strip club? Did you hear me? I heard you, I heard you, I heard you. I'm, I'm, he I'm said, waiting. do we wanna hit the strip club? I was like, first of all, you must be one of the comedians on the show because that's the funniest shit 
I've ever heard. Um, they have strip clubs in the North Pole. Uh, second question was, your audio, first of all, it was more of a reply. I was like, you're out of your fucking mind. There's no way on planet Earth. I'm going to a goddamn strip club. It's 61 below in the North Pole. Dude, you're crazy. So we up in the strip club, right? Uh, <laughs> it's a too hot cocoa minimum. Uh, the strippers have turtlenecks and ski equipment on. The fuck are you talking about? A strip? We really ended up in a strip club in the North Pole, and it was the locals, you, you, like like big booty Eskimo bitches. Like you know what I mean? Like it was the craziest thing I had ever seen <laughs> in my life. You'd see a stripper with Ugg boots and like a raccoon fur on her hair. I was like, I am really far away from home right now. That was just the beginning of the trip. Yeah, man. So people ask how I come up with material, traveling around the world. Got you. Okay. Um, do yeah, you travel? I, do you travel a lot? I do. I absolutely do. Yeah. You ever been to Texas? Sure. What part? I went to Colleen, Texas last week. My first time ever going to Colleen. Have you ever heard of Colleen, Texas? Have you even heard of it? It's central Texas. And it's pretty much known for two things. The world's biggest military base and its biggest in America is called Fort Hood. So it's one of the okay. biggest military bases in America. And it's the number one city in America for STDs. Sean, they are leading the league in cooties, brother. There was a gigantic billboard in the airport and it just said, gonorrhea welcomes you to Colleen, Texas. Oh, hold on. Because these jokes, right, they sell. Like before they were, we- That is the truth. I'm not lying to you. I, I put on a condom in baggage claim, brother. I kept that bitch on for two days until I left to go back to LA. You ever left a condom on for two days? Yes, I did, bro. <laughs> Brother, I was like, I got a wife and three kids. I can't even accidentally have some shit get on my shit before I go back home. And True this story. is actually a statistical fact. You Colleen can Google Texas. it. It is Fort Hood, the biggest uh, military base in America, and they are the number one city in America for STDs. Now, to just go further, just off the joke shit, I asked around, why is that? They said, by it being um, the biggest military base in the world, think about it. You think you're, you're, there's hundreds of thousands of young people between like 18 and 25 that are just, just in that fucking stage. And they're in a new city. They're messing around with everybody, the locals, and then all of the military people are doing it to each other. It is just a whole bunch of filthy and nasty shit going on. <laughs> Pass it around. You, whole, whole list. You now you got it. Go go give it to him. Pretty much. Oh, here's some here's some navy coochie. Bring that on over to the army. You know. <laughs> you know. So, real Crazy. talk. Traveling. Oh my god. All right. Um. Let, let Let's try to Let's try to. I'm sorry to throw you off with all these crazy stories, brother. No, I love them. I love them. Um, you you got to tell me, because I know what what was you uh, what was you on the Fresh Prince of Bel Air? Was you a writer? Was you yes. an actor? I wrote you the were... Fresh Prince of Bel Air, the original Fresh Prince of Bel Air for uh, four seasons. Oh, four I was seasons. on it. I was on it from ninety three to ninety seven. So okay. the question I get the most is, were you with the dark skin Aunt Viv or the light skin Aunt Viv? And I always <laughs> tell people the, the true story. I never met the dark skin at fifth. I literally came the month she was gone. I was Daphne Maxwell Reed who played the light skin. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, so, uh, and people always ask me, they're like, yo man, how, how did you become a writer on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, you know? Did you take writing class? Did you go to writing school? I'm like, brother, I, I am the epitome of the right place at the right time. I tell the story every day. I, I, I was a broke stand-up comic. I had $11 in my pocket. Caught the bus to the Loud Factory Comedy Club up in Hollywood. I had only been doing comedy six months. I probably only had five minutes of material. Um, uh, like I said, sat in a 13-hour line. 
did my thing that night, got off stage. Will Smith was sitting in the front row of the comedy club. Like, hold, hold on, way- hold on. Before you go forward, before you go forward, was, was there somebody huge headlining that night that you Not didn't know about? at all. It was so a regular, me- I remember like it was yesterday, July 2nd, 1992. It was a regular Tuesday night comedy show where, say, Tuesday night for the last 40 years has been amateur night at the Laugh Factory, right? Mm-hmm. Best comedy club in LA since the beginning of time. Um, and it's the night that's an open mic from like seven to nine. Like literally, if you have a 702 spot, there's nobody in the crowd. You go on at 730, there might be 10 people in the room. You go on at eight, yeah, there might be 30, 40 people in there. But what happened was I went, it, like, when I tell you God was on my side, I was the last out of all the amateurs. So Will obviously got there late for the regular comedy show, the eight o'clock show, but enough that it was now a packed room. So he got there about nine o'clock. I was the last of the amateurs. So imagine being an amateur comic. You don't even have three minutes of material and you're in a packed house in the hottest comedy club in LA. And you only been doing comedy six months. He was sitting in the front row and thank God this was way before he was slapping people, right? So- okay, Hold on, hold on, cause I, cause I, cause I gotta interject. Did, did, by the time that you went on, did yeah. you know Will Smith? Because at that time- No, Will Smith, Will no he's a superstar, he's a but superstar. as a, but I didn't know, I, I, no, I knew who he was, but I didn't but did, know he was in the room. I, Okay, you know that's what, I mean? what I'm asking. So, so your nerves are, are, are regular. You you going up there? I'm an amateur yeah. comic. I got nerves, but it exactly. ain't it ain't steroids because I know Will Smith. Is I'm sitting. not I'm not sitting in the audience to see who's here. I was just in the comedy bullpen, and they're like, "All right, you up next." No credits. I had to tell the nigga my name, Alex Thomas, bought me up, and he was sitting in the front row. Now, what I saw him in the front row when I did my shit. But after the show, he was like, yo, man, you real funny, man. My name is, I was like, I know who the hell you are. You Will Smith. He goes, yeah, man, I got this brand new TV show. I was like, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I I watch it every week. It had only been two on two years at that time. He goes, let me ask you a question. He goes, you were real funny, man. I'm like, oh, thanks, bro. He goes, "Um," he goes, do you write? I'm like, shit, you got a pen? (laughs) He's like, do you think you'd come down and help us with some funny stuff on the show? Like, like, like what you did tonight? I was, I was like, hold, hold on, let me check my schedule. Uh, uh, yes, I'm available. He goes, do you, when do you think you could come down? I'm like, shit, now? Can I get a ride with you? <laughs> and the rest was history. I was literally there the next day, for four years. And that's how I became friends of the family and people that I'll be friends with for the rest of my life. You know, so that's why I don't have anything bad to say about Will Smith, because he gave me my start. That was my first real check in Hollywood. And from being on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, it just opened up every single door for me. TV, film, movies, like literally every black show that came on uh, in the 90s after Fresh Prince, early 2000s. I was literally on it, behind it working on it to some capacity, whether it was warm-ups or I was on the show. I'm talking, I was worked on Living Single for four years. I worked on Moesha for four years. I worked on the Parkers for five years. I worked on the Wayans Brothers for five years. I worked on all of us for the whole the season. My wife and kids, like literally every Black show that a whole generation grew up on, I was a part of it in some kind of way. So it just opened up every door for me. You know, let, let, let's have a serious moment because it, this is this is one of those things. When something is for you, when when mm. when 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 God got you, when God truly has something for you, just go after it. Amen. Don't, don't worry about how you gonna get to it. Don't mm-hmm. if if He put it in your heart, this is for you. This is. What your passion is. This, this was passion. meant. This was meant to happen for me. I, I realized at an early stage in the game that all the ways you can get paid in this business, right? Whether you're doing acting, comedy, you know, stand up to to animation, to producing, to writing. I was like, I'm not gonna go back to a regular job. 
when I could do what I love and make some money and live and survive. So here I am 30 years later without ever having to have a regular job with a wife and kids. You know what I mean? So I can't even act like I'm not blessed. You know what I mean? Longevity. You know, everybody worry about how they going to get to the finish line. Just, just keep Stay the course. The Stay the course. Stay the Stick course. to the course. Wow. Okay. You, you mentioned Will Smith. Mm -hmm. um, so I got to bring up, did you, I mean, you're a fellow comedian. Mm -hmm. Chris Rock just did his comedy special. You mm -hmm. have obviously an allegiance to Will because Will, he was the catalyst to open so many doors for you. That mm -hmm. was your first real job. And he, he cherry picked you. Exactly. He spotted you and, and, and came and get, but you're a comedian. Right. Where, where does, how does this even uh, compute for you? Because I'm sure you have gone on stage and you, you said you, you performed uh, in Harlem at the Apollo. People get roasted in the Brother, crowd at the Apollo. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Anybody of a certain age, let's just say 30, let's just take 35 and older. Mm -hmm. We all know what the Apollo was all about. Yep. You watching it, you knew the routine, you knew the drill. Um, you're bringing back memories right now. And it almost, gives, it almost gives me chills because when I did Apollo in 1991, I was terrified, like any, any amateur. I mean, when you see stars that were getting booed off the stage, you're like, nigga, there is no chance for me this evening. How about, I'm just get straight to it. When I did Apollo, that was back when Mark Curry was the host, 1991. Yep. And all, and it was 13 amateurs and we all picked our numbers out of a hat. I thought God wasn't with me because I picked 13. I was like, why is this happening to me? My first time coming to New York, I paid my way to come here and this is gonna happen to me. 13 dudes picked and I picked number 13. When I tell you, Sean, 12 comics in a row got booed off the stage. They were booing people on intros. This next guy, boo, all the way from boo. You're really gonna boo. I was, I was shitting bricks backstage because I'm like, I don't have a chance. But Mark Curry knew me as one of the amateurs in LA and he had saw me a few times. He's like, you're a funny ass dude. He's like, you ain't gonna have no problem tonight. What do you want me to say to introduce you? He goes, first, I'm going to say, you're from L.A. I was like, nigga, no. That's the last thing I need is for you to say, ladies and gentlemen, all the way from L.A., boo. like, no, I don't need to get booed before I even start. He's like, well, he said, you don't have any credits. I said, well, just say, this guy is really funny. I've seen him before. Give it up for Alex Thomas. He gave my intro. Now, mind you, we had to do three, three minutes. Three minutes when you're a new comic seems like three hours. Mm -hmm. When I tell you, Sean, it was the fastest. I did the fastest set I had. I don't even care if the audience heard me. I was like, I'm going to get through my little three minutes before y'all niggas boo me. He's like, give it up for Alex Thomas. Hey, how you doing? Thank you. Good night. Still up and gave me a standing ovation. I was like, if I, first thing that went through my mind is they always say, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. And I knew I had something because I saw what they had just did to 12. It's like everybody in the room had an AK-47 and it was just open seated, just hauling them down. So whatever I said to make them laugh, I was like, you know what? I feel like I might be able to do this business. And lo and behold, who was in the audience that night? Bob Sumner. Mm. You know who Bob Sumner is? Absolutely. Absolutely. Bob was the talent coordinator for this new show that was about to come out in about a year. This new show called Deaf Comedy Jam. He saw me that night. Cut to things are now rolling. Now I'm on Deaf Comedy Jam. You're the kid that got the standing ovation in Apollo. 
You know that don't happen too often, son. <laughs> you know, that's an anomaly, yo. You know, I had people coming up here. You from Brooklyn, son? You, know, you, you from Queens? You, you from the block? You from Yonkers? From Long Island? You from 41st side? Where you from? You got your New York dialect down hack. Yeah, you, you, you from Best Style, yo? I'm like, nigga, no. And ever since then, for 30 years now, I've been one of those LA comics that can go to New York and rip any room to pieces. That was just always my material was very universal. It wasn't that, you know, I'm be honest, I'm not gonna say names. I've seen New York comics come to LA and bomb. I've seen LA comics go to New York and bomb, but I've seen those same dudes kill in rooms. I've seen them kill before, but it's like, it's so kind of like local material. You come to LA talking about what happened in the bodega up on 125th street. That like niggas, LA, what the fuck is a bodega? He don't know he could change that word to liquor store. Uh huh. Uh huh. He don't know nigga food is still everywhere. It's just, I was always right in the middle where I was able to go to any city in America and kill. So I love New okay, York. So, so I, I got, I got to circle you back around cause you yeah. are a comedian, right? Yeah. Yeah. People within eye shot, God forbid you in the first row. Mm -hmm. it, it is traditional that you get roasted. You can put on your best attire. You are you talking about from the comedian us to roast somebody in the audience? Yes. Oh, yes. Of course. Of course. All, so I, I, Chris Rock just did a special. Yep. And I got, how, how, how does it land with you as a comedian? Because Chris, he told a joke. He didn't do anything that no other comedian has, since the beginning of time, hasn't done. Mm -hmm. it slapped on national TV for it. Mm -hmm. And slapped by a dear friend of yours. Mm -hmm. where, where, where does your thought process even lie when you see that happening, number one, to a guy who took your career from zero to 100 mm -hmm. real quick, mm -hmm. and then to a fellow peer who's at the top of his game? Well, it was a tough night for me because I'm friends with both of them. Obviously, I'm way closer to Will than I am to Chris, but I was like, oh, this shit is not good right now. And I'll just tell you basically my thoughts and what I ended up bringing to the stage because obviously I had to address it because mm -hmm. everywhere I went after that or for the rest of my life, people gonna ask me, so what did you think about that whole Chris Rock, Will Smith situation? Long story short, Will made a mistake that night. Um, his last name is not Christ. I don't know anybody on this planet that has never made a mistake. Uh, he didn't kill anybody. He made a mistake. I don't care if you're a billionaire, you can still make mistakes. It, was, it wasn't a good look. Um, biggest night of his career, biggest accomplishment it was overshadowed because unfortunately what happened, right? Um, what I took to the stage, I basically said, uh, I just think uh, ain't gonna be no black folks at the Oscars for a long, long time. I said, in fact, it's gonna get so bad next year, they're gonna ban black tuxedos, okay? It's gonna be the, it's gonna be the first all white affair. Santa Claus might end up being the host next year, right? Because a lot of people don't realize this, Sean. The night started off incredible. It was actually the blackest Oscars in the history of Oscars. That night mm. was black producers, black yep. writers. I mean, it was black seat fillers. There was black nominees. There was black winners. I heard they had potato salad backstage. It was really a black. D, D Nice was the DJ. Do you know? that in, in Oscar history, there had never been a DJ. So for the fact that Will Packer, being a black producer, just brought the whole element of black folks to the highest level, it was amazing. It started off incredible until we got slapped back 400 years. I mean, <laughs> it started out as the Oscars and then one slap ended up being the Source Awards in 2.1 seconds, you know what I mean? And it's just un it's just unfortunate that that happened, man. And then Chris, as far as his special, a year later, hey man, 
he vented. He, 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 he let it all out. And you can't be mad at that man because at the end of the day, he was the victim. And it's almost like when we're talking about roasting and people in the front row and as a comic, there's also a decision to be made every night you go on stage. Like as a professional like Chris, right? All of us professionals, we have different material for different nights and different situations. A young comic, an up and coming comic, Ain't got it like that yet. He doesn't have different sets. Oh, this joke I can't do. He's just trying to be funny, however, by any means necessary. It was like that was one joke that backfired on him. But nobody can say, don't say it. He felt it. Chris is a legend. Chris is one of the funniest dudes to ever do it. He made that decision. He did it. Unfortunately, that happened. You know what I mean? It happened. It'll go down in history. It's something that will never, ever be forgotten. Um, I liked Chris's special. I still think he's one of the funniest dudes to ever do it. When it got to the will part, his real feelings came out. You, you, you saw the difference. And you, people, you and people it, all this, it went from all of a sudden to from funny, these are my jokes, to this is how I feel about that nigga, and I'm going to let it all off my chest. Everybody has to rehabilitate different. He could have went to an uh, entire year of therapy. But as comics, any real com comedian will tell you the stage is our therapy. I could have a bad day, Sean, but have a great set on stage tonight and all that shit get wiped away. I could have went through some crazy mess in my own personal life, but every time I'm on that stage, that is my sanctuary. You hear that with athletes a lot. When they're on that field, everything, it's like the world goes silent. And it's all about my craft of what got me here. And it's therapeutic for us. So as being a comedian that's a veteran, a triple OG, I felt his pain when he did that set. He had to get it off his chest somehow, some way. And he, he did it to the best of his ability. You know, I, I, I got to imagine as a comedian, that was a hard position for any of you guys to be in. Um, yeah. not just a comedian, but but a black comedian as well, right? Mm -hmm. Hollywood, black Hollywood is small. And all so, wait, not, not to cut you off, but we always say uh you, Hollywood is small, black Hollywood is two blocks. <laughs> like it really feels like that. I, I, I know I, it is extremely small. So y'all all know each other, and one of the the one of the true gifts that comedians have that most people don't have is you guys really get to speak on the hard topics, things that are socially not acceptable, yep. things that people feel in their heart, but they would never say out loud. And that's why we're appreciated because what you only think about, we bring it out. And we're taking Correct. that chance, especially in an effed up time like it is now, where it's like, everybody's the joke police. It's the first time in my life, in my career, in 30 years of doing this, Sean, that I feel like a lot of times I'm walking on eggshells when I'm on stage. You but know, I'm not- I want to go there. Yeah. How, how, is, how is woke society? Because we, we live in a completely different world. Um, than when we started 30 years ago in the 90s. Yes. How, how is this society affecting y'all's ability to do the job that you love to your fullest potential. I'm not gonna lie to you. Um, there's still ways, it's almost like going, I'm gonna be honest with you. It's like, if you were to go on David Letterman tonight, or if you were to go on Jimmy Kimmel, or you were going to Jimmy Fallon tonight, you know it's TV, mm -hmm. CBS, it's NBC. You're gonna be in here 10 minutes. Millions of people are gonna see you. You're gonna make some money, you're gonna have fun. You're gonna be able to, you know, um, uh, promote your show, your movie, your product, your book. You just can't cuss. That's right. just the rules. Because that's something called TV. Prime time. It's the same way I feel with that stage. It's not going to stop me from what I do. It's just fucked up that that's kind of the environment, the pulse of what's going on now. Trust me, 
Me not being able to talk about, you know, the gays or the lesbians or politics or this and that, that's not going to stop my career. That's not the only thing I talk about. You know what I mean? I, it, some people, people that are going to have a problem are the ones that that's all their material. I still know how to make a crowd laugh and not even have to go there. So in other words, I'm a comic that can be clean. I just don't like being clean. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. if you asked me to go on Jimmy Fallon right now, he needed 10 minutes tonight. I would destroy 10 minutes. But you come see that same set that I do at a small uh, little club in Brooklyn tonight. I can do the same jokes, but be cussing my ass off. The laughter is going to be different. I just tweaked a few things. When you go in front of white people, you just got to know they're much more politically correct. They get offended easy. Our culture is not like that. Our culture is like, nigga, I'm coming to get these chicken wings, drink this Hennessy, forget about my job I got to go to tomorrow and just have a great time. Nigga, talk your shit. White people aren't like that. They're like, oh, I can't believe you said that. Do you know my mother? Okay, I have a friend who's gay, and I think that's wrong. Okay, what are you talking about? You shouldn't have, you know, they're just, they just overthink it. You get what I'm saying? Black folks think of a fuck. His next nigga come to stay. He hilarious. Give it up, fo. You know what I mean? It's just our culture. You get what I'm saying? So to I said all that to answer your question. Um, the politically correct world we're living in, the, the pins and needles, you can say this, you can say that. You can get canceled if you do this. Catch, you just got to take it with a grain of salt. When you think about your material, either have a couple of versions or just certain shit. You can't believe me. There's sometimes... I have material that I can only talk about in my house or if we went to lunch right now or in a bar and I'd be like, and you, and I see that you're laughing your ass off, Sean. I'd be like, nigga, I wish I could take that to the stage. But if this was the Richard time, Eddie Murphy days, I would have took that to the stage. Absolutely. That's a fucked up part about it. Nah, you know, earlier you started right right before I cut in. Um, you was like, you know, you you're walking on eggshells these days, and that's such a messed up position to be. It really is. That's a comic, and that's only if let's just be honest. Uh, if you're, I hate to say, it, but if you're a nigga that don't give a fuck, you're gonna be doing the Chitlin Circuit the rest of your life. You'll make okay. some money, but you ain't gonna be on CBS no time soon. You're not going to be on ABC, NBC prime time. And let's just be honest. That's what we all would love to do. Cause that's where the real money's at. So you got to make a decision. So t- taking into consideration what you just said, th- does it make Dave Chappelle that much greater as yes. a comedian, as a human being, mm-hmm. as somebody who was willing to go against the grain despite yeah. knowing all of the things that you just said and having Absolutely. to lose. And Do trust me. This man is the holy grail himself in, yeah. in incarnation. I'm not going to lie to you. Not only is that my brother, that's my friend, and we came up together. This picture circle. I just somebody just sent me a picture. You know, anybody ever send you a picture on the internet that a picture you totally forgot about? You were 19 or you were 20. Somebody sent me a picture of me and Dave Chappelle walking on the streets of Manhattan at nigga in 1991. We looked like we were 12 and 15 years old. Oh man. Like we came up together. Like I love him for what he did, what he is, what he's become. And to answer your question, yes, because I can't lie. I have a wife and three kids. I can't say fuck Hollywood yet, nigga. I need to work. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I can't get to the point where I don't give a fuck what they think. I'm going to do my shit. I say that to an extent. You get what I'm saying? But Dave has taken it to that level where he can give a fuck less what they think. Right? Still be rich and successful and live happily ever after. Not too many people could say that. I mean, you know, like I just admitted that to you. Hey, man, mm-hmm. I, I would love to have an ABC TV show. Nigga, that's that's three times more than a show on Netflix. That's three times more than a than, than doing a goddamn podcast that's making nothing. You get what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, I'm gonna use the word they, and I think you know what they is. They still run this shit. And if you rub them and you know who them is, 
you rub them the wrong way and they think you're too much of a Negro, oh, you'll do a little work here and there, but you're not going to get to that highest level. But for Dave to be able to be that chink in the armor and do what he's done, hey, man, it's, it's brilliant and I commend him on it. No, you got to give it up to that brother. I, I, I'm going I'm to keep it so real. Like, I, I don't do what you guys do. Um, but to see how he is willing to say F it, to see how he's willing to say, if you take this from me, mm -hmm. it's almost not worth me doing because exactly. I can't enjoy it to say, like, like this is so pure. Just and I'm just watching him from the outside in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Met him a few times in my life, but you can tell it's so pure for him that he'd rather do it for zero. And it's easy to say it when you're a multi, multi, multi millionaire. Mm -hmm. But he'd rather do it his way and not do it at all. So, so yeah. I get up to that man. Oh, I'm all day, all day. But you know, it's almost like saying there's a ton of different avenues in this world. In this business, you know, they say it's a ton of different ways to skin a cat or whatever. Uh, I think they really mean that over in Asia because they will eat that motherfucker. But um, <laughs> how do you want your cat skin? Do you want that uh, broiled, fried? Uh, <laughs> but um, there's a lot of different ways you can still get successful. You know what I mean? Everybody's got different styles. It'd be like if we were talking about hip hop right now. It's a bunch of filthy rich motherfuckers in hip hop. With different styles, but we could talk oh, who the Holy Grail is, right? They still were successful, but there's other guys nowadays. Come on, man, you know hip hop like I do. It'd be a nigga that yep. came out last Thursday, and this nigga's triple platinum with a billion streams, and you know what I mean? It's it's just a different ways to get it. The different ways. I mean, you know something? You just brought up hip hop. Oh, um, that's my lane. I, I got to pick man. your brain on this. Come on, man. Let's go. Hip hop is one of the most dangerous jobs on planet Earth right now. And and we, they said they said hip hop is hip hop is more dangerous than going to the military or being a police officer right now. OK. One hundred percent. A hip hip hop artists have to wear bulletproof vests to go get smoothies, nigga. <laughs> I mean. It's scary. Hip hop artists, it is a target on your back like never before. Absolutely. I, I got to ask you, like, we just spoke about woke society being politically correct. Mm -hmm. and we also spoke about, you know, hip hoppers, like how dangerous that job is. So in, in some regards, being a comedian, there's some things you can't say mm -hmm. because you might be canceled. Mm -hmm. But do you... <laughs> Uh, 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 uh y'all just knowing what's going on in the world of hip hop, are y'all actually scared to say the things that you would normally Back. say, knowing that yo, it might be a nigga in this crowd, like, 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 it might Back. be one of these hip hop dudes in this crowd about to blast off on me? Or do it's you so crazy? It's so crazy you say that because I do a whole thing in my act about this serious? topic, nigga. You gotta come see me live, bro. Like when I tell you, it's as real as it gets in my world. I noticed. As I've matured as a comic, 30 years in now, I've just got more and more honest. And like, cause it, it's, it's like, when you're a new comedian, you're just trying to be funny. Hope some people like you, right? But as you mature and grow, you start being, nigga, I can't be nobody else but me. And go. all I'm gonna do is tell my stories and the way I see things. And I feel like the more honest I got over the years, the funnier this shit was because it, it's coming from me. You can tell it's coming from me. It's my perspective. It's what happened to me. Don't get me wrong. I'm like any other comic. There's certain things that topics that happen, happen in the world. And hey, I'm going to talk about it like everybody else. Like I have a whole joke I do on stage about I have one of my boys that uh, is a young black politician in D.C., and he told me, he told me some inside shit. He was like, bro, you probably won't believe this, but he said, there's, <clears throat> there's talks amongst the inside of the, the military, not the military, the, uh, the political world, that if Donald Trump was to come back to become president 2024, if that 
miraculously happens. They said that the man is trying to bring back cotton picking. Did you hear that? Did you hear anything about that? I, I, I no. I that, didn't is, know. that is the truth. He was going to try to bring back cotton picking. That's it. Oh, this, this is not a joke. You oh, no, no. Punchline, this, this is real? This, this, this is not a joke, brother. I'm, they Get said, I'm about, to, I'm about to tell you the end of it. He said he's going to try to bring back cotton picking. But he said, here's the flip side. They said, if he does, he's trying to make it a six-figure-a-year job. So niggas will be picking cotton all day long. That means a nigga going to have to make a decision. I'm going to ask you right now, Sean, just me and you, ain't nobody else on this, and all I need is a yes or a no, Sean. Don't say nothing else but a yes or a no. Or a half a million dollars a year, would you pick cotton? Absolutely. You cotton picking right, nigga. And I'm gonna be your and I'm gonna be your cotton picking assistant. Okay. I'm gonna be right there with you in some Gucci flip-flops, a Louis Vuitton backpack, and some beats by Dre. Sean, we're gonna be in the fields TikToking, my nigga. We're gonna be out that motherfucker. This is America. This is America. This is America. <laughs> nigga, we going viral. Okay. I take shit when I hear stories like that. I just say what goes on in my mind and I just take it to the stage. I take it to Yo, the let, stage, brother. Let me, let me ask you, because because taking it to the stage could be a little dangerous. Like, what's the craziest thing that ever happened to you on stage? Well, it's two things. How much time do we have, Sean? As much time as you give me. It, 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 two, two things. The, the most recent was five months before COVID. I'm in Kansas City at the Improv, sold out show. Everybody's having a great time. Lady in the front row of my show. She looked like she could be in her mid fifties, whatever, laughing her ass off. Middle of my show, goes into cardiac arrest. Scares the fuck out of me. They cut off my mic, bring up the lights. Paramedics come in. I am still standing on stage in front of a live audience. They are pumping her chest. And I'm like, oh my God. Like, I can't believe this is happening to me on stage, right? And I'm looking at, I'm watching it like everybody else. I'm like, do you understand? If she don't make it, your boy is going down in comedy history. They're gonna be like, how was the Kansas City show? I'm be like, nigga, I killed. <laughs> Literally. I feel so bad laughing at that, man. I, you know what I mean? So that was the <laughs> that was one of the craziest situations. And then I gotta take it all the way back to amateur night 1991. And this place called Birdland West in Los Angeles. At that time, DL Hewley was the host. It's the most ghetto. Gangster club in LA history as far as stand-up comedy goes. Smack dab, middle of Long Beach, all Crips. Snoop is actually in the audience before he was Snoop Dogg, when the nigga was Calvin Broadus, okay? <laughs> and he remembers this night. It's crazy. I've only been doing comedy, man, maybe a year. And it was the Long Beach Comedy Festival amateur competition. Okay, thousand dollars for the winner. Uh, DL's the host, and I don't hang out in Long Beach a lot. I totally forgot that Long Beach was like all Crips, and this is '91, so the banging shit was still very, very active. All I know, Sean, is the night before I was at the Jungle Fever premiere. Okay, with Spike Lee, and it was a Hollywood Boulevard. And at the Jungle Fever premiere, they gave out Jungle Fever hats. Do you remember Jungle Fever? Oh, absolutely. It was a shout, joke. Shout out to, um, Come Snipes. on, man. And, and Spike Lee had just uh, uh, started his store on Melrose. He had the 40 Acres and a Mule store yeah. on, on Melrose. But they gave out Jungle Fever hats at the premiere. Now, mind you, the next day is my little amateur competition where I'm going to try to make me $1,000. I'm on the bus, nigga, okay? 
the jungle fever hat was red. Oh my God. <laughs> so it didn't dawn to me till I got to the club uh, in Long Beach that Long Beach is all Crips. Cause all I know is the next day, that morning, I went to the Beverly Center. I got me a polo rugby. Remember polo rugby's? Yeah, and please tell me you wasn't trying to match it with the hat. That's exactly what I did. Oh. A red and white polo rugby to match my red jungle fever hat. I had on some tan like polo khakis and like some white Chuck Taylors. I'm like, oh, nigga, I'm gonna kill him at this little amateur competition. Because way before I started doing comedy, I was a fly nigga, you know, but I didn't even really have money. I was a fly nigga, man. I get, I pull up to that amateur competition. It's so crypt out in Long Beach that the valets parkers at the comedy club had blue vest on. That's that's how gangster it was. They looked at me like, nigga, do you know where you are? Did did you did you get a wrong address? Did you not watch boards in the hood? Are you serious? Right. I'm just an amateur comic, man. I'm trying to come up here and get this $1,000, right? I walk in the club. DL, like what you want me to say, man? Almost like that same Apollo situation. Because it was like that same year. He's like, what you, he had seen, again, he saw me as a little amateur. He liked me. He was like, this little, fun, this little nigga's funny, right? And I didn't have no credits. He's just like, hey, man, go up there and do your thing. I'm all right. I'm going to bring you up next. I'm like, cool. Birdland West was this, it was a super huge club. It felt like it took five minutes to walk from the back of the club to the stage. He's like, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Alex Thomas. Comedy competition. I come up, nigga. When I tell you it was two of the biggest crips I have ever seen in my life, sitting in the front row with their feet on the stage. This niggas look like it was a nigga named homicide and a nigga named felony sitting in the front row with their feet on the stage. Now, mind you, I'm a, I'm an amateur. I have to do three minutes like all the other amateurs. Long Beach was very brutal. Long Beach was the West Coast version of the Apollo. They came there to, 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 to destroy you and boo you. Okay. So I get on stage, it's a packed house, and both of these niggas in the front row lifted up their shirts at the exact same time. And all I see is two nickel plated Glocks. And they were just like, Nick, we fitting to kill you, cuz. Why are you laughing so hard, Sean? I'm terrified, okay? You fitting to die, cuz. And it didn't register to me because Ivan said, hello. I didn't say, hi, how y'all doing? The place is packed. It's like 300 people. These niggas just said, we gonna kill you, cuz. And nigga, a light went on in my head and I looked down at my shirt. <laughs> I looked at my hat. I was like, oh my God, these niggas think I'm a blood, right? So all of a sudden, I got so scared that I couldn't speak. I don't know. If you've ever had a gun pulled on you before, okay. But the fear, it felt like the niggas had two guns to my temples. Like they're about to kill me, right? I got so scared, I couldn't speak. So all of a sudden, in a matter of less than 20 seconds, all 300 people are booing me. I mean, vicious, we hate you. Go kill yourself, go play in traffic fall on something sharp, jump off the nearest bridge. Fuck you, we hate you. They're booing me, dude. I didn't even say hello. I didn't even say hi. You guys don't know anything about me. And you're booing me? Next thing I know, it went from 300 boos to 300 niggas jiggling their keys. From jiggling their keys, 300 niggas doing sirens. They did three different things. They would boo. Imagine 300 people jiggling their keys. And oh, then they would what's the jiggling the keys thing. What is that? Just imagine a room full of everybody pulling out their keys. No, niggas, I'm, I'm clear on it, that. What does that it mean? It sounds like everybody's got a tambourine, nigga. It sounds like like get the fuck off the stage. This is the light. This is the sound of nigga, you suck. This is the sound of nigga, go get a regular job, right? So 
they booing me, jingling keys, and then all of a sudden I feel something hit my face. Nigga, it was a chicken bone. The niggas sitting next to the stage threw their basket of chicken at me. Like, nigga, it got, it got violent, nigga. This is how real nigga comedy clubs were early in the 80s, right? I mean, in the late 90s. So all of a sudden, it went from booing, jiggling keys, oh, I forgot the sirens. It, nigga, it was mayhem in that motherfucker. That's how bad they wanted me off the stage. You do remember I didn't say hello, right? You, you do know they're not booing me because my jokes are bad, nigga. I never got to say hello. So All you the, never ever, like, you didn't do your set? You I did not even say hi, how you doing? Because the niggas immediately sold me their guns and I froze up. Remember, I've only been doing comedy less than a year. I, my knees we're literally shaking. Just my life is flashing before me. I'm like, nigga, I'm from South Central and I haven't had a gun pulled on me. Now I'm trying to fucking do comedy and I'm about to die in a comedy stage in my jungle fever hat, right? So out of nowhere, out of nowhere, all of a sudden it went from booze, ch keys, chicken bones and sirens to thunderous laughter. I'm talking, you would think I was Richard motherfucking prior they started all of a sudden dying laughing at me you remember when i told you i had on some tan khakis yeah i peed on myself are you serious i am not am i laughing am i joking i peed on myself nigga it with tan khakis it looked like i jumped in the river nigga like when i tell you my pants were soaked so i guess the crowd thought oh maybe that's the niggas jokes Maybe that's that's the PP man. Maybe that's what that nigga does. Thunderous laughter. I completely peed on myself. And when DL saw that I peed on myself, and he saw the boot, he just he just came on stage. I never said a word. He he hugged me on stage. He's like, yo, but his back is towards me. He whispered in my ear. He's like, what happened, man? What what? I've seen you before. You funny. I was like, the two niggas in the front have guns. And they said they were going to kill me. And he was like, man, which one? Because his whole style was talking shit about people. Uh -huh, like, uh -huh. which ones? Which ones? Like, I'm going to get their ass. I'm like, no. I probably want to kill you also. <laughs> just just, just, just get out of here. Right? So the, he, he said, all right, man. He said, just go. He said, man, what the fuck did y'all do to this nigga? Now, all of a sudden, they're dying. They're laughing. Because, you know, DL, he's not a star yet, but he's huge in L.A. And that's uh -huh. his style. Remember, DL picked up right after Robin Harris died that year. Oh, yeah. Robin Harris died that year, and DL became the new host of LA. And he just basically did Robin Harris's whole style. I thought, what you looking at, nigga? With your motherfucking Jerry Curl. And then it, that was just his style of comedy. Long story short, remember I told you it felt like it took five minutes to walk to the stage? Mm -hmm. It felt like it took 30 minutes to leave that motherfucker. Because, nigga, I'm walking to the back and I'm getting booed and laughter at the same time as I'm walking. I just wanted to get the fuck out of there and never come to this place again. Nigga, I ran to the bus stop. So hold on, you pissed all over yourself and then got to take the bus home. And then got to take the motherfucking bus home. You asked me about a crazy night on stage. I'm giving it to you. I can't make this shit up. I got to the bus home. I'm damn near crying like what am i doing why am i doing this business is this shit gonna be is this shit gonna work out for me blah 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 i gotta i gotta give you the end of the story so the end of the story was i didn't go back to the club for two years because i was terrified two years later in 93 they had another amateur competition and i i built the balls and 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 and, and the heart to go back, and how about I won the competition two years later, 93 amateur comp competition in Long Beach. Ask me what I was wearing. I, 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 I'm, I'm willing to bet all my money in the world that you was wearing a nice blue outfit. <laughs> I'm about to fuck you up. 
nigga, I wore a pink polo and a and a cross color uh outfit, nigga. I looked like I was motherfucking in a in a Spike Lee movie. I I had thirteen thousand colors, <laughs> and I went and won that motherfucking uh competition, man. Just because oh, I was like, I wasn't gonna let that stop me in my career. Good for you. Good. Hold on. Please tell me you had a chance to sit down with Snoop and and and, and talk. Oh, about we it. talked about it years later. Snoop remembers it like it was the back of his hand. I, who was what? Who yeah, what? yeah. And Dio, Dio was like, "Nigga, I'm a, I'm not gonna lie, nigga. I thought you were never gonna come back from that." <laughs> Yo, you want to know what's crazy though, Alex? In this was that a crazy story though? Oh, the craziest story. Like, like I, I'm thinking you gonna say something like that's obvious. Somebody rushed you on stage or. Somebody threw something crazy at you. A female came up on stage and started humping. Who knows? I this you took me so left field with this one. Yeah, no idea where I was going with it. Crazy. True story. Nah, you know, I I, I don't want to move the conversation on because you 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 dropping. Even though it's funny, it's th- somebody somebody out there. They they. At the beginning of their career, they're at 91. Where you was in 91, they're there right now. They're second. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you, you, we done talked about the Chris Rocks, the Dave Chappelle's. We talked about Mark Curry, um, DL, Hughley, um, just so many of the greats, Bernie Max. But we also talked about that rapper who put up a song on Thursday and by, by Friday, he he's an overnight six. It don't work like that. Yeah. You look at the man that's celebrating 30 years in the business mm-hmm. and, and you hearing the, the, the turmoil you and you hearing how long it takes to get to that mountaintop. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we we live in a crazy world where everything is on demand. It's the, the microwave society. It's people. instant. That's what the whole Instagram, you know, people yes. are literally sleeping on their mama couch with a blue check that they verified. <laughs> Signing autographs like they're truly talented. The Internet has found a way to make uh, a lot of untalented people with no clue. Uh, famous. Or, or found a way to get a little money here and there, but the the the, the, the key word is insta, and nothing in life uh, is instant most of the time when it comes to talent, when it comes to putting a lifetime of work, hard energy, uh, blood, gu- guts, and glory into a craft. It, it, it becomes a point in your life that you cannot cheat the process. People ask me all the time, does it bother you when these little internet comedians are on the show? I'm like, absolutely not. I don't care if you told me the nigga had 300 million followers. He ain't funny like me. And he'll find out real quick when you hand him the mic. Great. Um, I just did a show recently. And they're like, hey, we have a little internet sensation here tonight. And uh, can he go up and do five minutes for you? I'm like, nigga, no problem. Like, like really? You know, he has five million followers. I, I, I don't care. Right. I see the dude, five million followers. He ain't got five minutes of jokes. You understand? And the crowd can tell the difference. No, he's one of them Instagram niggas. Stop saying you're a comedian. There's a difference. Anybody can trip and fall on some funny for 30 seconds. You know what I mean? My whole thing is I have respect for those guys that treat this to treat this craft like it's a craft. I just because I, I don't want any of the young generation to think I'm hating on them. And trust me, if I was that dude and they had social media back then, I, I bet Nick would have 300 million followers. You know what I mean? But if you still work on your craft, I respect that. You know, cats like DC Young Flies and yeah, Reed yeah. O'Brown and Lewis, guys that started off on the internet, but they realize stand up is a whole nother beast. I had nothing but respect for those guys. You know what I mean? But the truth, you, you can't. Comedy is one thing you can't fake. There is, you know, rappers can fake it. You can actually be hot garbage and suck. But if a nigga puts a beat behind you, you can fool everybody with a hit song. You can't fool nobody with comedy. No, it's, it's you and the mic in that crowd. And they going to tell you what they feel, whether you like it or not. You up there butt naked with no producers, 
No lighting technicians. This is no hair, makeup, wardrobe. It's all you, bro. Damn. Um, I, I, you know, I really hope that- It's part- always been known. It's always been known, though. Like, it's a fact. Way before us, or way after us, comedy has always been known as the hardest art form in the entertainment business. So I didn't make that up. That's just a fact. Yeah, I mean, yo, do you know how hard it is to make somebody laugh consistently? You know, just like- put yourself right now in front of 300 strangers. I know people that have a tough time walking into a restaurant, somebody's house and shaking hands and having a conversation with a brand new person. That's my job. I have to go into a room full of strangers every night of my life and let alone more than just say hello. I got to make you like me for an hour. Try that. Yeah, yeah, not an easy job. Not an easy job. Um, we spoke about some legends. Mm-hmm. Did you catch Monique special on um Netflix? I didn't, man. And I've been friends with Monique for a lot of years. I hear about all the mess and the conflict, and I, I really don't keep up with it. She's a cool person to me. We've always been friends, but I heard about all the craziness, but I didn't get a chance to see her special. Did you see it? I saw it and um, like, what is the, can you kind of like brief me a little bit about, cause I'm really, I don't really, I'm not up on it. What was the, the latest beef? I knew about the stuff with the whole Netflix and she felt, you know, the money and what you're giving the men and what you're giving the women. But just tell me about the special. Was it good? Was it not? Was it angry? Was it upset? Was it bitter? Was it funny? I mean, no, I didn't no, see. No. You know, I, I think that, um, I would say, I would say it wasn't angry. Mm-hmm. I don't stretch of the imagination. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she, she addressed the, 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 the I, I mean, we all know what she went through to even get right. on Netflix. Right, right. But it felt, it felt like she could have went in more. Um, similar to even with Chris Rock. Mm-hmm. Chris Rock did, I, I wouldn't change and gave seven minutes to what people really wanted to see. You know, this is why we tuned in. Same thing with her. I, I don't, I, and this is just showing. I don't think it was her funniest, but I don't take anything away from her as the legend that she is. And I pray to mm-hmm. God that she actually got the money that she deserved. But mm-hmm. with that being said, you know, she went out there on a limb, um, but for equality in terms of pay, mm-hmm. pay me what I'm worth. I don't, I don't know that that special said that. I, oh, okay. I yeah. Okay. At the end, when, when, at the, when it's all said and done, I don't know that people left and said, you know what, girl? You was worth every dime. That right, you right, right, right. Yeah. Right, right. It, it, but sometimes, I, sometimes all the mess can get in the way. You know, that's the unfortunate part because she is funny. Chris is funny. Like when you see funny. He only gave you seven minutes of what you came to see. First of all, in defense of him, it ain't easy coming up with a whole new hour. That's number one. Yes, that was something he had to address. But he also wanted to know, hey, man, in a year, there's a bunch of other shit I want to talk about, too, because, you know, your special can only be so long. Get what I'm saying? It's not like, and then, you know what? You're, You're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Because then if he had got up there and did a whole hour about the Oscar shit, then it's like, okay, nigga, enough. Can you tell us about some, you know what I mean? You can't please everybody. That's one thing we learn in this business. You, you can't please everybody. You no, I, I, people I definitely People that love don't. you, at the end of the day, it helps them sell tickets on the road. You know what I mean? You know, you, you, it's, it's an it's a interesting position, both of them, as comics were put in. Yeah. You know, how much do I give to this thing before people are like, yo, enough. What, what else do you have that's new? But the, the flip right. side of it is, this is the reason why people came to begin with. We, we, we understand you are who you are. Yeah. You're going to back the house regardless, but but we know why we're here. Mm-hmm. So it was an interesting position for, for both of them yeah. to be in. Yeah, that's true. So I, want, I want to touch your brain on something. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you, are, you are from the left coast. You're... you're, you're Central, born and raised, hundred mm-hmm. percent Californian. What what is it about that place 
like like California, La La Land, Hollywood. I don't watch some of the best of the best. And, and going, we could start with the Dave Chappelle's of the world that just mm -hmm. seem like they done had meltdowns in front of the world. Like Cat Williams a few years ago. Like this nigga done just completely lost it. Martin Lawrence, who I love to death. <laughs> like, like, just, like, what is it about California that seems to just break people? Like, like, and these are funny dudes. Like they, 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 their therapy is what they do for a living. And Hollywood still seems like, nope, you chew them up, chew them up, spit them out. Right. A hundred percent. Let me tell you how I avoid all that. I'm from here. So it's a huge difference. We always say, uh, I grew here. You flew here. Mm. Very deep. 98%. All those guys you mentioned, and I just happen to be a, a dude that's cool with everybody. They all are imports. They all came from somewhere else to come to LA to become a star or whatever it is. When you're born and raised here, all the so-called Hollywood bullshit doesn't affect you the way it affects other people. I truly am the same guy as I was before the fame for TV before movies, before making millions of dollars doing what I love to do. So the, the Hollywood bullshit kind of just bounced off of me and trickled off. Like one of the number one questions I get, you've been in this business 30 years. How did you avoid the drugs and the alcohol and all the gay stuff and all that stuff? I'm like, well, I'm gonna start with, again, I'm a nigga from South Central LA and I grew up seeing it in my family and destroying my family. Mm -hmm. had two or three cousins that have overdosed. I grew up around Crips, Bloods, gangbanging, killing, street shit, and all the shit that you would see. So like, nigga, coming to Hollywood was like going to a country club. You get it? Yeah, yeah. I saw it before I got there. Why the fuck would I fuck with drugs when I have two cousins that overdosed? I didn't get the, you know, people that come, come from LA and they're like, yeah, this is the parties. This is what we do. Like, oh, it's new. Let me try something. Let me do this. Let me, no, no. Saw it on the block. Saw it at my grandma's house. It, 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 it was in my face all day, every day. So I'm not going to just now all of a sudden start because I'm at such and such's house. I'm not going to mention names. I've been at some of the biggest stars on the planet. And the cocaine is passed around like M&M's on a goddamn fruit plate. Damn. And I'm like, nah, nigga, I'm good. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm still going to have a ball at this party. All these women up in here, we're going to have a good time. I just don't do that shit. That's the shit that fucked up my neighborhood. That's the shit that killed my cousin. Nigga, that's the shit right there. You go to jail and fuck up for life. And like, How many more examples do we need of how drugs and alcohol fucked people up? But a lot of times, people come to this city googly-eyed. Well, if that star does it, if that star does it, if I'm at this party, nigga, I'm at the Playboy Mansion. It, that's what we do here. No, that, that might be what you do here. But that's still the shit that fucked up my family uh, 20 minutes from here. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, that's, I just, I think it, the reason I didn't get caught up in all that bullshit because I grew up here. And it was nothing new to me. Think of how many people it's new to them when they land this place. I'm not talking about drugs. Drugs and alcohol is everywhere. But to it, people are weak when they come here. So when they get around stars and people, they feel like, well, if he's doing it, it must be okay. Mm -hmm. Nigga, did you, you have a backbone where you lived? Before you got up? I mean, yeah, cocaine's bad here, but isn't it bad in your city too? <laughs> you know what I mean? Or want to kill you anywhere. I don't give a fuck where you're from. You know, so. Nah, it just seemed to be something about that place that turned people out and, and, and it has taken down some of the biggest stars. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. I had too many examples of how it could fuck your life up. So it was a no-brainer to not go down that road. You know yeah. what I mean? 
I mean, especially even in your community, because I'm thinking off the top of my head, like like it's going back. You could think of of the Richard Pryors. The- oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So to to, to to address that, right? Since the beginning of time, if you didn't know, comedians have always been known as damn near the lower echelon of the entertainment. Meaning, we're the stereotype, we're the alcoholics, we're the drug addicts, we're the depressed guys. Where do we turn our pain into laughter and pressure? Like that is the 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 dark cloud negativity part of what we do, but I'm here to say not all of us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, and with you saying that, you get weak people that be like, well, the greats did it, so I might as well give it a shot. You know what I mean? Not, not if you have a backbone. Good for you. Good for yeah. you. Yeah, so. You, you know, we were talking offline about you being a father. Love it. Mm-hmm. Best thing that's ever happened to me. You started late, bro. I started late, but I started right on time. You know what I mean? Nothing against, shout out all my boys and all the brothers out there that were having four kids by 30. I don't know how they did it because I know uh, how much it takes out of me now. I'm just going to speak on behalf of me, Alex Thomas. Brother, if I had kids in my 20s and 30s, like a lot of my boys did, I would have been a horrible father. I would have been a horrible daddy. Because I would have been trying to change diapers, but still uh, stripping uh, and, 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 and paying strippers money in the strip clubs and still uh, doing homework before I go hang out with some porn stars. Like, no, it wouldn't have worked. I had, I had to be done with that life. I lived that crazy Hollywood, being on TV, movies, and all the wild shit, less the drugs and the other shit, crazy shit. I just had a good time, but a lot of different females. <laughs> Thank God I don't have any kids that I know of. So with that being said, <laughs> no, but I have three amazing children, seven, five, two years old, a beautiful black wife that has my back and is the greatest thing that ever happened to me, man. And I needed that in my life to slow me the fuck down. And it did for the good. You know what I mean? So. No. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And you I have kids? Say, yes, I, I, but my kids are older now. Oh, and that's, okay. that's, the whole, that's why I said, I was even telling you offline, if I had it to do all over again, I would have did it just like you. Now, th- the good thing is, you know, you have them young and your kids are older. Yeah, you're hanging out and still doing things with them, yeah. With, yeah, so so that's a beautiful thing. But the, But the flip, you know, but when you're young, and especially somebody like yourself, somebody like myself, who were just laser focused with career. Exactly. You, you, you're chasing something else. And all those kids want is time. All they need is time. Absolutely. So that's a beautiful thing about my wife. Um, she helps that balance. Mm-hmm. She makes sure I, she taught me that word balance. I didn't know a goddamn thing about that. Being a single dude that was out in the streets for a whole lot of years. <laughs> you know what I mean? I admit I had to learn that part, you know, but when you see the fruits of your labor and you see how the kids are turning out and they're doing great, man, it makes you go, man, this is what it's all about. No, nah, it's, it's a beautiful thing. God bless you. God bless you. So let me you. ask you a question. What are the ages of your kids? 24, no, 25, 25 and 26. Okay. So a few things just want to throw out at you. Uh, first of all, I had no clue it was this expensive to be a father. And I'm guessing it's a whole lot more expensive now than it was 24 and 25 years ago. Correct. In fact, I'm going to put you to the test and I'm going to ask you a question. Do you mm-hmm. remember buying your face ba- first baby stroller for that 25-year-old when he was, was it a girl or boy? Boy. When I, I do, I do remember it. How much, just off the top of your head, how much you think a baby stroller was 25 years ago? I'm going to take a random guess. Just a random guess. 250, 300, maybe. Okay. Maybe. Okay. So me and my wife just went baby stroller shopping last week. Get a new baby stroller. It's this place. All the women that know this is called Bye Bye Baby. Okay. Yep, yep. Sean, first of all, I didn't know there was this many different name brand stroller companies. It looked like a used car lot when we walked into this place. 
Dude walked up to me like, welcome to Bye Bye Baby. Can we help you? I was like, yeah, man, we're looking for a stroller. My wife saw this real nice one right next to me. She's like, oh, my God, I love this one. I was like, my man, yo, we're we, we going to get this one. He was like, that's a great choice. That there is the 2023 bugaboo. Heated seats, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, just 1900 Excuse me? I, I said, excuse me. Excuse, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about like the real cars. I'm talking about, the, I said, the baby, the baby chair right here. This this is what I want. The one with the little four wheels. He's like, oh, that's 1900. I was like, 1900? Yo, oh, Alex. Babies, wait, let me finish. Let, let me finish. I said, yeah, yeah. 1900 for the baby stroller? He was like, well, you know, what you picked was the Mercedes Benz Ferrari strollers. I was like, okay, well, show us to the 82 Cutlass area, okay? Bring me to the 94 Altima section, okay? Do you guys have Hyundais in this motherfucker? It's what I'm trying to find out. 1900? I'm like, the nigga was born last Thursday. 1900? Heated seats, nigga? We have blankets. 1900? Yeah, man. Times have changed 25 years ago, brother. Good Lord. I, I, I'm i thinking this is a joke. Uh, I, I, what did I, I tell you? I'm telling you my life. What'd you say? I just can't believe that there is a stroller on the market that's nineteen hundred dollars. And right? how about how about drive itself, nigga? And how about my Tesla? Get but go ahead. Pretty much, it's the Tesla. It's the Tesla. And how about we had to end up getting another one because now we have a another baby. We had a pandemic baby, also by the way, my yeah, son, two year old. Two year old man, he was born August 3rd, 2020. He was a straight pandemic baby. Like the nigga was born with a mask on, like for real, for real, right? <laughs> uh, his stroller was 2300. Hold on, you, 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 y'all. So you actually went through and bought these strollers. Do you think, do you, do you think I, I'm I, just I, telling I you, you, you think I'm like, making shit up? No, I thought that that's what it would, would. Okay, we got the Mercedes. Or, but we First of all, it's so oh, fly. It's so man. fucking fly that you could sit it and I could push you in the mall right now, nigga. I could push your 49, however, 48 year old ass in this goddamn stroller and you would be having a ball. Like I'm talking suspension. It pushes, I could push it with one finger, nigga. That bitch turns, with, look, it's crazy. Leather handles. It, I'm not exaggerating yeah, at man, all. Is there a resale market for, for, for stroller? Because this back in the days, you used to hand the stroller down to your cousin who just had a kid or what? Like, nigga, we will be putting this stroller back on the market. Like, absolutely. There's, there's but no here's the crazy I'm part we live in an area called Studio City. It's a lot of white people. It's a very nice area. You go to malls around here and you see them all over the place. Like, it's, it's so like the status quo now. It's crazy. People, so when I pull up in the mall like and I'm a Range Rover out there, it's like having a Range Rover. Pretty out much. There. Pre, I, and I'm not exaggerating. Pretty much. Oh, I can keep going. My wife had me buy her a $750 breast pump. Okay. Excuse me. Thank you. You said your kids are 24, 25. So you would know nothing about this. There's this new breast pump. It costs $750 and it's Wi Fi. And it latches onto my wife's breast. I'm not making any of this shit up. And it sucks the milk out of her breast and automatically pumps it into little four ounce bottles for the baby, hands free. Like we could be walking around at a bar right now and you don't know under her shirt, they're pumping. I'm not making this up. It's on Amazon. What what's the Wi-Fi for? Uh, because it can, you can connect it to your phone. It's automatic, like so her I know it sounds like I'm joking, right? Sound like I'm making this shit up. I, I'm not a scientist, nigga. I'm just telling you what the fuck is in my house right now. We could be at a concert right now. She could be like, oh, the single ladies. Oh, the single. And nigga, she's on the Wi-Fi. And the motherfucker's pumping her titties with her, with her milk. Right? So the first thing went to my mind. I told my wife, wait a second, $750. I was like, my question is, as a man, um... Does this device, does it homogenize the milk coming exactly. out? Of this? Nigga, does it turn your titty milk into chocolate milk? I'm just wondering, does it turn into soy? 
gluten-free soy milk? Like, what the fuck? Is this some whole field, whole foods milk coming out your titties? I told it because baby, I can suck the milk out your titties for free. I'm really good at it. I'm really <laughs> There's two cups. Like, I can do this shit myself, bro. I can't make this shit up, Sean. I can't make this shit up. Oh, my goodness. You're hilarious. Wait, let me ask you one last question. Let me ask you one last question. 24 to 25 year old. Did you ever take your kids to Disneyland back in the day, 24, 25 years ago? No. uh -uh. You were just like all these other niggas, man. I found out there's so many black folks are like, oh, no, we never went. I mean, because obviously, you know that it's always been a super expensive place. Yes. And you know their slogan, right? Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. Yes. It's now the most expensive place on earth. The reason I asked you, because I was hoping that you would have remembered how much you paid 24, 25 years ago. No clue? Yo, no, I have no idea. I have no idea what Disney cost 25 years ago. Do you, do you have any idea how much it costs now? No, not at all. Why? 30,000 you, you 30, per child. 30,000. 30,000 what? Uh, dollars. We had to make a decision. It was either college or Mickey Mouse. Hold on. It, because, <laughs> I'm oh, I'm like, what? <laughs> but it's so expensive, brother. It felt like it was 30,000. It's like 450, something like that per kid now. I'm not oh, even like, Is that a day pass? Uh, with a day pass, yeah, we did get the day pass. And then how about this though? Let me, let me, cause, because I, I don't know. <laughs> when I said day pass, I'm thinking, is that like to get in? No, the you, day pass is it's $450 so you don't have to stand in like an hour line. You know what I mean? Look, look. It, it, the bottom line is, it's expensive as fuck. And how about Sean? They don't let you bring any food down because this was two months ago. We took our daughter. They don't let you bring any food. You can't bring a cookie. You can't slide an apple in that bitch. You can't bring a pack of Skittles in that motherfucker. And and why is that, Sean? Because they getting you at the concession. They want you to buy the Disneyland food where the fries are ninety seven dollars. Popcorn, a hundred and thirty-two fifty. Now I know somebody who went there. It was like, uh, uh, like, like water was something like seven dollars and fifty cents. Oh yeah, I bought five nieces and nephews and my kids. Do the math, brother. I spent a half a million dollars on lunch. <laughs> Crazy. So yeah, that. Now you ask me why am I a parent? I started late because that really wouldn't have been going down in my twenties. No, I, I can tell you, it wouldn't have been. No, that I, money would have been spent in Magic City. <laughs> Listen, uh, I, and, I, and I'm trying, and I'm trying to be as as considerate of your time as humanly possible. I I, I got to talk about your book. Oh, you, thank you, man. We started this off by saying you got a number one book on Amazon. Congratulations, mm. my brother. Thank you. The funny thank don't you. stop. The well, funny you know. don't stop. Man, I'm very proud of it. It was my pandemic project. Uh, not going to lie. It was like, I don't know if we're ever going to hit a stage again. Uh, long story short, this amazing artist named Mike Goldstein slid into my DMs one day as a fan and literally drew one of my, pick, one of my jokes. He just, one of my favorite jokes, and he drew it and put it into animation and illustration. I was so blown away by the artwork that I was like, yo, let's do another one. Yo, let's do another. I got a ton of jokes. Yo, let's. So it was crazy to see all my jokes and crazy ideas come to life through animation and illustration. Next thing I know, I had a top selling book on Amazon. And it's, it's, it's not like a lot of, guys books that we know it's all animated and illustrated and it's just my crazy thoughts and a lot of my crazy jokes and you get it on amazon it's called the funny don't stop or you can go to my instagram at funny man alex thomas that's funny man alex thomas all one word click the link in the bio and it'll take you directly uh to amazon to pick up the book it's only 24.99 
Come on, it'll be the best little twenty four ninety nine you ever spent because you're gonna laugh your ass off. Do it come with a signature? It doesn't. <laughs> that's when you gotta catch me live. So uh, funny you say that. So I, that's why I mean I sell out every city I go to, every city I perform in. I bring like fifty or hundred books, and I just sell out like like Blue Magic Brothers. But so when they buy it live, when I'm in, you know, live when they come to my shows. I sell them for twenty dollars, and with twenty dollars, you get a picture with me, and I sign it. Mm. So on the people that buy it on Amazon, twenty four ninety nine. You're not getting the picture. You're not getting that. But you know what I mean. Check my schedule out. Find out when I'm in a city near you. Come to my show. I'll take a picture with you, and I'll sign it. You, you know. You know. My last question for you: mm -hmm. the, the pandemic it shuts your whole thing down. Um, just like so many other industries, so mm -hmm. many people make their money on the road. They wasn't able to get on the road. Mm -hmm. Is it back to normal for you? Like, like how often are you traveling now? Man, I've done shit almost 38 cities already this year. Damn. Like I travel like crazy. It was crazy because the pandemic is like, that was the longest I had ever went without being on an airplane. You know what I mean? I had to figure out a way. My podcast, by the grace of God, took off like crazy during the pandemic. The whole world was forced to be on Zoom and StreamYard and all that kind of stuff. And through my podcast, which is called The Funny Don't Stop Show, the book is called The Funny Don't Stop, the name of my podcast, at The Funny Don't Stop Show. So I utilize this platform right here, these headphones, this mic right here. This became my comedy club. This became my this became my stage. It was my way to vent and get my thoughts and crazy ideas. And every time I do live interviews like you, hey man, we laugh. I end up using that shit on stage. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So this was my way of working out material in a very organic way that the people don't even realize that that joke I just said when you laughed. Come see me this weekend in New Jersey in front of 5,000 people. You can see that same goddamn joke. Killing. You know what I mean? So it was a beautiful thing, man. It was a gift and a curse. I got closer to my family. I got a lot done. I'm not going to lie. We remodeled our whole house during the pandemic. You know what I mean? I got closer to my family. It was, it was still a blessing. Thank God for being in this business all these years. There's this thing called residuals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you ain't working you getting paid for tv shows and movies and shit you did 15 20 years ago you know what i mean um but the three things and i'll leave you on this the th three things i'm very proud that i got done during the pandemic i got my prostate checked i got a colonic and a colonoscopy I have, a, you. I have a brand new booty hole i'm just being honest with you um, there was more activity in my ass than a RuPaul <laughs> picnic, brother. Okay. It, they was, they was heavy up in me. I'm not gonna lie, man. Kind of really fucked me up when we lost chat with Bozeman. Yes. Black yes. Panther, 43 years old, died of colon cancer. And I immediately did my homework. And when I found out that colon cancer is one of the number one killers of black men in America, I was yep. like, you know what? I'm not going to be like a lot of brothers to wait for something to happen after he passed away. I'm like, I'm going to be proactive. I'm going to get this shit done because I want to be here for my wife and my kids. Uh, and it was, a, it was a grueling process, but I'm happy I did it. You know? No, and, I, I did mine too. So oh, I congratulations. You're, oh, yeah. Oh, so you're, 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 you're a, a member of the new booty club. Okay, congratulations, brother. We clean. We my booty hole is cleaner than the than than, than the whitest society, nigga. Okay, it's brand new. I, and I tell brothers, Sean, for all the brothers out there that are that are listening to me, they be like, "Oh hell no, nah, nigga, ain't nobody getting up in my ass." I'm like, "That's the only way they can get in your asshole. It's the only they way they can't go through your eyes, they can't go through your ears, they can't go through your mouth. The shit is real. You can sit here and talk about it all you want." When you find out you're walking around and you got a goddamn football in your ass, you're going to feel like, okay, this shit might be swollen. There's a beach ball in my asshole right now. I need to go get this shit fixed. And I tell people the story, man. It was, 
you know, to ease brothers' minds, man, my prostate check was just 30 seconds, bro. Now, I'm not going to lie. It felt weird being asshole naked with another man in, 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 in the room with me. And, and I had a real rude uh, booty doctor. He was really rude. I walked in. He was like, Okay, bend over. I'm like, nigga, I don't even. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You wasn't awake for this, for this, was you? Say it again. You wasn't what? awake. No, I'm about, I'm about, I'm gonna tell you the story. Okay, but go they, ahead. They don't put you to sleep with a prostate, nigga. That's just two fingers That's in your right. asshole. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get to the put to sleep. I'm gonna get you there. I'm about to say, nigga, where did you go? Did they put you to sleep to go thirty seconds in your ass? So. It was 30 seconds, but he was just like, yo, bend over. And I'm like, my man, I, I just met you. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't, am I, am I supposed to be on my elbow? I don't know if I was supposed to grab my ankles. I don't know. Do I put my knees up on the bed? I didn't know. Right. So he did what he had to do. And he was just like, okay, you're finished. I was like, what do you, what do you mean you're finished? I was like, you're done. I was like, I didn't feel anything. I, I, am I that easy? Like, did you just slide up in me that Either he had some little ass fingers or he had a whole lot of loop. I don't know because I didn't look back. You know what I mean? I'll, I mean, I didn't hear nothing. I, I didn't hear none of that, right? And he takes his clipboard and he just walks out on me and I'm just standing there naked. I'm just like, I mean, are you going to call me? You know what I mean? Like, what the fuck? You know, so that was my prostate check. And then uh, two weeks later, I went and got a colonic and as you no know, colonic is cleansing your ass out. That's just hot water cleansing your ass out. And it's a clear tube. And they lay you there. And you're actually looking at all of the bullshit of your life right in front of your eyes. You realize how filthy you are. I'm laying there, Sean. And nigga, it looked like black tar was coming out my ass. I was seeing shit that I ate. I was like, nigga, oxtails. I haven't had oxtails in like. 15, I'm like black licorice. That's how I had black licorice it was like 89. It was a fair. And I was like, well, hold up, nigga. Is that a dime? I swallowed that dime when I was like six, nigga. You know what I mean? Like all this shit right in front of my eyes. But when I when it was over, 15 pounds lighter, got all the toxins out. My body, my fucking skin was glowing. I, was, I felt great. I'm like, this shit's incredible, right? So the last one was the colonoscopy. That took an hour. I had to hold my wife's hand for that. And they did put me to sleep for that. I'm terrified because I've never been sedated. No one's ever put me to sleep. I don't know what to expect. I'm, I'm sitting, I'm asking a billion questions. I'm asking the lady, like, so what, yo, what, like, what are you about to do? She's like, don't worry. You're not going to feel anything once the propofol gets in you. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa stop. The fuck did you say? Propofol? What's the first name that comes to your mind when you think propofol? Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. I was like, hold up. She's like, well, you know, Michael did it. I was like, yeah, but bitch, he didn't wake up. Okay. It scared the fuck out of me because I knew the story about how that's how he had to sleep every night for the last, last year of his life. That Dr. Conrad Murray was giving him propofol every night. But obviously he's a doctor. He knew how much of it. And she was like, don't worry Trust me, this is what I do. You're going to count from 10 backwards. And by five, you'll be in Never Never Land. I'm like, bitch, that's not funny. It's fucking not funny. I don't need any goddamn Michael Jackson jokes right now. And I didn't believe her. I'm like, yeah, right, whatever. So it's that strong. She's like, trust me, count from five. I mean, from 10 and by five, you'll be knocked out. I was like, whatever. I'm like, you know, 10, nine, nigga, eight, seven, (laughs) six. When I tell you, I now know why Michael Jackson was on propofol. Sean, it was the best sleep I've got in 15 years. I was waiting years. for you to finish. I was waiting brother, for you to brother, finish. Brother, I was asleep for one hour. It felt like I slept for six months. I woke up, Sean, I was a brand new man. Sean, I woke up white with perfect credit. That's it. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you how the, the, the sleep. It is, put it this way: for anybody who is on the fence or in denial or 
I'm not going to get a colonoscopy, but the sleep alone is worth it. It was incredible. I almost felt like they I almost didn't believe they went up in me until she showed me the the uh like the x-ray. Yep. Of that that my insides were cool. Cause when I say you feel nothing, but nothing. it was the best sleep, it really made me see, like I'm not even trying to be funny. Michael Jackson had the type of money to, you know, so-called get the best doctors and that didn't work out, but it, this, that he used that every night to go to sleep. It's sad that he had to go there to get sleep though. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah, it ended up not working out, but man, it was some of the best sleep I've ever had in my life. Like you no, wish really you could is. sleep like that every night. You know what I mean? It really is. That that sleep is amazing. I'll tell anybody that. I'm like, look, I know you ain't looking forward to it. Yeah. And it is it is one of them things that you definitely yeah. uh as a man and especially as a black man in our community, yeah. we ain't doing the colonoscopy. Yeah. yeah. But I got the three Pete, brother. I got the three Pete. I got the triple X. Yeah. I, I, I did two of the three. I did two of the three. I never got the the what, what, what was the colonic. The, the, colonic. I never got the colonic. So, so the, the, the prostate's 30 seconds, colonic is 30 minutes, and the colonoscopy is an hour. Well, I'm going to tell you, the prostate, I had a little white woman, um, <laughs> and, and you said you ain't feel nothing. This woman was like a, a, a animal. Like, <laughs> I felt so violated when this woman did this to me. And then she turned around and was like, Thank God that I'm a little white woman. I got small hands. I'm like, it felt like a bear was back there. Like, are you kidding me? Didn't you feel like the rock. You felt like the rock gave you a goddamn oh, no. <laughs> no. Like, bitch, can you not use your fist? Jesus. Nah, I, I thought, and she got a big old smile out of that. Because, you know, I'm a big guy. She was like, bend yes. over and crammed herself. She was like, thank God I got small fingers. I was like, no, you don't. <laughs> Here's a public oh. service announcement. Go ahead and get your prostate check. Go ahead and get that colonoscopy. You can't right. beat it. Hey, Amen. That's my public service announcement for the day. I had a lot of fun with you, though, man. This was really cool, brother. Nah, likewise, I enjoyed the conversation. Alex, yeah. you funny, funny dude, man. Like right now, my larynx hurt. Like you got, <laughs> you got to do. Oh, <laughs> my frame of my chest is hurt, and I've been laughing so much. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Nah, I appreciate the time, man. Please go pick up his book, "The Funny Don't Stop." Absolutely. Log in out the podcast the funny don't stop and and where can they find you so that they can check you you've been on the road 38 oh yeah F funny man alex thomas that'll let you know what city i'm in and i'm not gonna lie i'm not gonna try to blow smoke up my own ass but i'm very entertaining on instagram you're going to laugh uh i do crazy memes it's just my life my family my jokes my podcast i love cigars i love golf you know, it's one of my hats, Inglewoods. You know, I'm the ghetto Tiger Woods, right? They call me In they call me Inglewoods. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I have a whole golf life that's separate from Alex Thomas. In fact, my golf page is I'm Inglewoods. I am I N G L E W O O D S. Real talk. Check out I'm Inglewoods on uh, Instagram, and you'd be like, this really is a total different person. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Alex, man, uh, again, I thank you for, for coming thank on you. time um, and brightening up my day. And I'm sure this is going to be everybody's day who see it. Best of luck. Continue blessings and yes. much love, my brother. Appreciate it, but Thank you for having me. And uh, make sure you let me know when this comes out. And then, you know, we'll post it and clip and let everybody know. I absolutely will. All right, man. Have a good day. What's up guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love. Make every move a power move. And I'll catch you all on the next video.